Praise God. Give it up for SOS, everybody. They got a little nervous in the beginning. Good job. All right, everybody, please be seated. They see all these people here, and they got all nervous. Listen up, you. Let's give it up for SOS one more time, everybody. All the young people praising God, lifting up His name. Ooh, beautiful, beautiful. All right, all right. Now let's go. In a deep, can we go deep today? Can we go deep? Can we go deep, deep, deep? We need to go deep. Okay, we need to go deep today. Let's go deep. Let's talk about deep faith with God. And let's start in Hebrews 11. And let's look at that from verse 1. We're going to do 3 and then we'll jump to 6. Let's read together. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. But without faith... It is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Woo, amen. My goodness. All right. We want to go in deep. I've I've been told to please speak a little slower. So we'll, we'll go in a little, I don't know, I'm from New York, so you know, you speak fast. <laughs> you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to stay slow. I want to, I really want to meditate on some of these words because it is so important. But you know, as we're battling and as we're fighting on the battleground and as we're facing the enemies and those kind of, uh, we're having those kind of, uh, fights in our life, which is really essential. You know, what's so uh, empowering to see these young people singing, praising God? They're the next generation of warriors of Christ. You know, and they have their own journey to go through to discover Christ. And that's so so amazing that they're walking down that path. All right, this is, when we see this, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I mean, we could just literally stay on that for the whole period. But before that, I want to talk about generally the context here. We all know that under the Han Mother's leadership, unfortunately, all these things have happened. The redaction of Texas, text, the Bible has been totally, uh, 80% has been changed. The uh, national anthem, family pledge, blessing vows, change from monotheism to diatheism on our quest to be God. You've all heard me talk about this millions of times. If you haven't, go watch the videos. Excluded DP from the Constitution. All these things that we have seen before our eyes. This is literally history has been unfolding while these desecrations have been taking place. We see her leaving her position as faithful, obedient object. She's not the subject. Proclaiming herself as God, Messiah, only begotten daughter. We see her promoting the Han tribe, her tribe, which is by definition of Satan's lineage because anything outside of the Messiah has Satanic lineage. So we see her promoting the Satanic lineage. We also see her dethroning True Father. And all of you have seen these pictures, right, in the last three years. This is just this year. She's now sitting in Father's throne in total defiance. And every time, you know, I talk about this, this is, it's painful for me to see on a personal level because that's my mommy. Right? But on a principal level, it's very clear what's happening. That's a dethroning of the king. Okay, so we see these kind of things happening. We didn't even know, but we found out that during the 2013 uh, Foundation Day blessing, of course, everybody knows the rings, but look what happened on the inside of the ring. Only Han Hakja's name. Father's name has been taken out from the blessing ring. 
the ring that you wear on your finger to signify your everlasting covenant with God. Only her name, the fallen lineage's name is there. That is unbelievable. If it, just even that in itself, that in itself is a clear sign of what she has done. So we're in this context, we're in this situation. And I think one of the biggest questions is, how could this be, right? How did this happen? How did this manifest? How did this occur? So we, let's, we want to look into, we want to investigate, because these are important things to learn, not only in your own lives, but in your, how you raise your children, how you will raise the next generation. It is important to learn from her fall, to learn what happened, to provoke her to do this. So, we, so how did, the question is here, how did she digest the dark nights of the soul? In any life of faith, and in any life moving towards Christ, there's always dark nights of the soul. Always. It's a part of the path. Amen? Dark nights of the soul are inevitable. You cannot run from them. You will have them. They're absolutely essential. How you deal with them will determine where you will end up. So how did she deal with the dark nights of the soul? When her believing and her faith was shaken, could she distinguish between believing, which is her 5% responsibility, and faith? What is the difference between belief and faith? Isn't that a good question? What is the difference? Is there a difference between believing and faith? It's a very serious question, and it's a very important one for all our spiritual lives. Amen? Very important. So what can be learned about how to deal with the darkness of the soul? Let's look at the standard definition. This is from Marian website, uh, Webster. And let's look at here, faith. I have a person with a mic here. Rio, you got a mic? Who wants to read the definition of faith? I'm going to ask you guys to read some definitions. Who wants to read? Come on. Raman, I saw your hand. Okay, let Raman read. I don't know if I can see it from here. Though. Can you see that? Oh, you can't see it. Can't is see that hard to see? Okay. Okay, it, that is kind of small, right? That is kind of... Just turn on your your binocular Hello? vision, yes. man. What's up with you? I know, I know. I'm getting old. Okay. Um, can I come up? <laughs> okay, come, okay, come on up here. So what does that say? Faith right here? And let's says, just read these synopsis right here. Strong belief in that... In tr- or trust. Or, or trust in... Someone. Someone or something. Okay. Help me. Belief. <laughs> belief is the... S- in the existence, in of the God. existence of God, strong religious, strong beliefs. religious feelings or beliefs. Beliefs. Thank you for the binocular vision. <laughs> that worked. That was that was very nice. Thank you, Raman. Can we get him some ramen, please? Okay. The dark night of the soul. So, so here we see the common definition of faith, which is absolutely one of the bedrocks of our lives. Faith is a belief. It's a belief in something or someone. It is a belief in existence of God. It is a system of religious beliefs. This is how we commonly understand faith. Is it, is it not? Right? That's how we usually understand faith. Faith as being a belief in something. So we all struggle with these, with belief and faith. And notice that when you struggle, when you are facing a dark night of the soul, when you're struggling in your faith, what is the question we ask? The question we usually ask is, God, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong that I'm experiencing this dark night of the soul? Amen? Right? How many have done that? All right, see? There we go. So when we have difficulty in our faith, our common response is to ask, what have I done wrong, God? But notice what this implies. This implies... That when we were doing something right, we had consolation in our faith, right? And now that we're doing something wrong, we no longer, or we have this dark night. Do you see? It's predicated on me because we believe faith is a belief. So what are the differences between believing and faith? Are they the same? 
This is Calvin. He talked about faith. And he said that faith enables the believer to know God's preferred will. Okay, or the Thelma. Accordingly, faith and God's preferred will are directly connected in Scripture. Faith is not just a belief. It is a type of knowledge. Isn't that interesting? Faith is not just a belief. It's not something you attest to or something you say, yeah, 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 I believe in that. That's not, that is not faith. Faith is a type of belief. It's an enabler the believer to know God's preferred will, the will of God. It is almost like a super knowledge in the sense that we are try- we're, we, through faith, we can understand God's preferred will. We can understand what He wants to be accomplished, what His mandates are. Do you see how, how that would be absolutely supreme in our lives, right? That would be the highest type of knowledge. So faith is also always received from God. It's never generated by us. This is, a, this is gonna bother, this is gonna, you know, work out your mind. It's gonna stretch your mind. I wanna work you today a little bit, you know? I mean, it's gonna stretch your mind. Think about faith, how we usually work with faith. Think about faith, that it is generated by us. It's a belief that we attest to. It's coming from us. We think that's faith. But faith is received from God. It's never, never, never generated by us. Isn't that interesting? How so? Let's look at Romans 12 and 3. Let's read this together. This is big enough for somebody to read, right? How about over here? We got a sister right here? Let's have this sister read it right here. Can you read that for us, sister? You ain't no good? Okay. Sister Luce, you want to read that for us? Read that for us. Okay, young lady, you can read that for us. Read Romans 12 and 13 right there. Um, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. As God has allotted to each a measure of faith. In other words, God has given to each a measure, a span, a amount of faith. Isn't that interesting? It's not something that we generate. Isn't that interesting? It is something that God allots to us, gives to us. It's a radically different view of faith, right? It's, it's actually 180 degrees different from how we normally think about faith. What's this? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Who wants to read that? This is like a Bible study right here. Go ahead, Robbie. Right there. For, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. So this is the common trap of faith. It's Look at that, right there. Not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. Usually in our faith, we're thinking, oh, I did this, or I am believing hard, or I'm doing prayer conditions, or I'm fasting, and so my faith is growing. We're thinking that we can generate the faith. Do you see what I mean? And the problem with that is that we will end up, as Paul writes here, we will start boasting. We will get what is known as self-righteous. So it's so important to understand that by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourself. Look at this. Faith is the gift of God. It is a gift from God. So in other words, faith is not something that comes from within. It's something that comes from without. Isn't that interesting? It enters into us. It's not something that we produce and then, you know, uh, ex- what is it, um, shoot out. Faith is a gift of God. It is a type of knowledge. It is a type of knowledge of God's preferred, per- preferred will. What does that mean? The original word, the root word for, uh, in this case, pistis, is pieto. And the word pieto is where we get piety, right? Filial piety in English, or, or in pietas in Latin. 
Other Romance language will be pretty similar. But this is the word for persuasion. It means, faith literally is the word for persuasion, persuaded, to be persuaded, to, uh, to, to be persuaded to trust in. So notice that it's not us persuading ourselves. It is God persuading us. It is a knowledge of His divine will. And that is what's so incredible when we understand faith. What faith is. It is not a generating a belief. It's not something I'm manifesting through my own efforts. But it is a receiving knowledge. It's a a knowledge that we're receiving from God. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? I kind of visualized it like this. Like there's a big waterfall. And we're not trying to grab the water of faith. But we're opening our hands and letting the water fall right in. And we're thanking God for that gift of faith. You see what I mean? Does that, does that help visualize it a little bit? Or like you're knocking on the door. And that would be belief. Your belief is you're knocking on the door. But faith is when you're given the gift of coming in. When he says come in. You now have the gift of faith to come into His presence. Isn't that interesting? It's a totally different view of how we see faith. Faith is not manifested. I know there's a lot of you know people who may even struggle with the idea of God, etc., whatever. All these things. These things, we, are, we many times struggle because we think that it's coming from within. We have to sort of... I'm not being faithful enough, or I'm not, you see, we've heard this, right? I'm not being uh, religious enough, or I have too little faith, in, you know, right? But if we understand faith actually comes from God, it is a gift of God, it totally reverses, reverses, flips it over. I found an incredible um, uh, passage by Charles Price, theologian on uh, Faith. And let's, let's read this together. We have made faith a condition of mind. When it is a divinely imparted grace of the heart, we can receive faith only as He gives it. You cannot manufacture faith. You cannot work it up. You can believe a promise, and at the same time, not have the faith to appropriate it. Genuine scriptural faith is not our ability to count it done, but is the deep consciousness divinely imparted to the heart of man that it is done. It is the faith that only God can give. Do not struggle in the power of the will. What a mistake to take our belief in God and call it faith. Christ, the living word, is our sufficiency. Let's read that, that one more time. What a mistake to take our belief in God and call it faith. Isn't that interesting? That's a mistake. It's a mistake to call our belief in God faith. Faith is not generated from within. This is a... a, 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 So the sort of synopsis is, a person believing... When you're believing... Let's think about when we're believing, when we're trying to believe on God's promises. In our own lives, in our prayers, uh, you know, they can be large meta prayers, they can be very, you know, large grand prayers, or they can be small prayers for uh, ourselves or another. But let's think about how we usually believe, right? A person's believing... So this here, belief is man's response. That's my responsibility, to believe on the promises of God. That's vital, Okay, that is vital. That is part of the, pros- the, the, the picture. However, a personal encounter with Christ, a true connection 
with him and his word is always, always, always necessary. It's always necessary for believing to be transformed into faith. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So, just like we saw, faith is not just believing in God. It is the gift that God imparts onto the soul of man. It's the deep consciousness of knowing that His promise is done. You see what I mean? See how powerful that is? See how confident and strong that is? It's not something we are generating from within, but it is a gift that is imparted onto our soul. As if God is etchy, right? It says He writes the epistles on our heart. God writes these, He etches this divine impartation, consciousness, solid, solid faith as gift to us. Look at this. A, through a personal encounter. This is why we miss it all the time. I'm trying to believe. I'm trying to have faith. I'm trying to, you know, seek Him. I'm trying, I'm trying to do, what am I doing wrong? Right? What are we doing wrong? We're trying to muster it up. We're trying to create it, generate it. That's the problem. In other words, that is our belief, but that's not faith. In order for the belief to transform into faith, it must come in contact to Christ through His Word. It must. Otherwise, it's not faith. Isn't that interesting? If it doesn't come, if you do not have a personal relationship with Him and His Word, an encounter with Him and His Word, that's not faith. That's you believing, trying to believe. You see the difference? Isn't that interesting? What in the context of absolute faith, love, and obedience? Isn't that interesting? It's absolutely critical to understand what our faith is, because it's fundamental. It's absolutely fundamental. Let's look at the DP, what it says. This is on page 9. This is the first reference of faith in the divine principle. And let's read what it says. Let's read this together. The reason why people who believe in God continue to commit sins is because their faith in God has been merely conceptual. It, or faith, has not touched their innermost feelings. Who among them would ever dare to commit sin if they experienced God in the depths of their being? Would they not tremble if they felt the reality of the heavenly law that those who commit crimes cannot escape the destiny of hell? So you can see very clearly Look at what Father's talking about here. Right? Touched. Experienced. There has to be an, an encounter with Christ. Otherwise, it's just you believing. That's not faith. And what does Scripture said? It said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. See, when you under, now you can see why that can move mountains, right? Because that seed is not something you're generating. Isn't that interesting? It's a divinely imparted gift. And that tiny seed, as small as it must be, if that gift was given a faith, that small, that tiny seed is from God. And so thus in that tiny seed has the power of the entire universe, right? more than the universe. So when we understand faith in this way, our belief, we can, we can dissect it from belief. We can separate it from our belief. Because faith is radically different from belief. Let's look at Matthew 8 here. This is the story of the centurion. Everybody knows the story. This is a story where Jesus wants to, goes to Capernaum. And he meets the centurion. He's basically, you know, has troops under him. Um, thank you. He has troops under him, and his servant is lying at home of palsy, grievously tormented, and Jesus says to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion says, Lord, I'm not worthy 
that thou should come under my roof. Okay? And he says, I have soldiers, I tell them to go, they go. I know, he basically says, I know if you just say it, it's gonna be done. Right? If you just say the word, I know he's gonna be healed. Right? Notice how the centurion's belief, when he's coming to this area where he knows Jesus is, he's walking there, he's believing, right? He's walking to this place where Jesus is, and he's walking to him, and in that moment, he's believing in Christ, right? He's believing. You see what I mean? But then when he encounters Christ, when he encounters Christ, this type of faith, appears. It's not from him, it is from God. The centurion answered, Lord, I'm not worthy that you come, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. What did Jesus say about him? I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. See, faith is directly connected to an encounter with Christ. It cannot be separated from a encounter with Him or His living Word, right? Because in the beginning was the Word, right? It was God, and with Him was was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. He's a, Christ is the living Word. So without encountering Him, without encountering Him through the Word. We cannot have faith. It doesn't, it stays on, at belief. It doesn't transform into rock solid faith. Isn't that interesting? So in our life, that's the same thing. That's why we seek to have an experience with the Holy Spirit, with Father Spirit. Amen? Because every week when we're shaking or every, every time we go through a, a season, we're not just mustering this with our belief, right? Because that has limitation. We're trying to make that belief come into contact with Christ and by His grace at the right time that He chooses, He will transform that belief into faith. And when you have that faith, now you have power to overcome that mountain. Isn't that interesting? It, it is directly connected to encountering Christ. You have, we have to encounter Christ in order for us to even have a seed's worth of, mustard seed's worth of faith. It is essential. So maybe the prayer we should be asking is, Oh God, help me believe in you. No. Help me encounter you. Amen. Let's look at Matthew 9. This is the story of the woman with the uh, issue of blood. We covered that last week with the talit. And the kids uh, drew Jesus with the talit correctly. That's how a Jewish man looks in the ancient world. He doesn't wear the Roman colors of gold and red and white. He wears the talit with the hems, right? The craspidons and the kanaf. And look at the same thing. She comes, she's, you know, wrestling through this crowd. She gets to him. She touches the kanaf of his garment, the krasvadan of his garment. She touches him. And in the scripture, right above it said, Jesus felt virtue leave his body. When she touched him, he, Jesus felt something leave his body. Right? Because there were thousands of people around. They're all bumping into each other. You know, it's like when you're in a big crowd, Right? And they're bumping, bumping, bumping. But, can't. but then he feels somebody, because the scripture says, virtue left him. So he felt something leave him. And so he turns out, who touched me? And then this, he has this conversation with her. She said within herself, if I may touch the hem of his garment, or his garment, I will be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith has made thee whole. See, again, we make the mistake of saying, oh, thy faith has made you whole. All I have to do is believe. Wrong. Wrong. Believing will not get you the healing or the blessing. Isn't that interesting? It is an important part of it, but it is not faith. Isn't that interesting? It's not faith. When the woman is walking up to Christ, she is believing, she's believing on the promise of God. She knows the Son of Man, Son of God. I will touch Him. If I touch Him, I will get, I believe, I believe, I believe. 
But she has to have the touch. Amen. How many want the touch of God? Yeah. See, we need the touch. We don't have the touch. We can't have faith. It's not possible. Belief is so different from faith. So different. It is a totally different... It's, it's connected, but it is, it is totally different. Let's look at Romans 9. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, had not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, as a gift from God, but as it were by the works of the law, only human responsibility, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. How many unifications stumble at this stumbling stone? Huh? Right? By my effort, by my believing, my faith. I will, I will set my foundation of faith. Do you see how already that's misunderstanding faith? Do you see that? Which is why we stumble. What we see, that we don't attain righteousness, we have not attained the righteousness of the law of righteousness, because we sought it not by faith, but by our works, by our effort, by our human will. We sought it. We thought we could be righteous by our own effort. And that we don't need a touch from God to transform that. This is Galatians three twenty one and 22. Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Look at that. Look, faith of Jesus Christ might be, what's that word? Given. Given. And notice that it didn't say, and my faith be given. It said what? The faith of Jesus be given. Who had absolute faith? Right? Messiah has absolute faith. It's not something he's generating. It is given. It might be given to them believe. And believe is a part of it. It's a part of it. But... When we think that just by believing hard, what's that movie where it says, just believe and it will become something like that? I can't remember what was it. Some Peter Pan or something like that? Some kind of movie like that, right? And then they got all these new age books like The Secret Say, oh, all you gotta do is believe in it and it's gonna come. The universe is gonna send it to you. Right? Faith, but, of Christ might be given to them that believe. Believing is our responsibility, but it is not the faith. The faith is when that belief is transformed into a divinely imparted consciousness that knows that it's done. It's a rock. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't shake. It's a rock. So when we look at this picture, when we see the Han mother when I actually think about my time with her in our house, I can see now the pattern which happened. We always knew that it was not a healthy pattern, but the reason why it would end up at this type of fall. Because every time she had dark nights of the soul, every time she had dark, dark days, She had a habit. She would even talk to the kids about it. She would call us in and say, you know, why is Father like this? Or why is He doing like this? Or why doesn't He ever keep His promises? Why is He not faithful? All this, always, constant. So this type of continual, habitual thinking, Believing God forsake her. See, no touch, even though she's right with Christ. Because 
the faith comes from her generating it and how she's loyal and how she's faithful. You see, she's doing all the work. Not realizing that actually that gift is a gift given by the encounter she has by being with Christ. And this leads to a habit of self-pity, which then transforms into a habit of self-righteousness, which is, I did it. I made Father. I suffer this much. He didn't really suffer. I suffer. And I made Father. I made Him become self-righteous. Then it becomes easy for Satan to dominate. And then you see all those demons surrounding her and then taking control of her. So in the dark night of faith, which every single one of us had, has, and will have, the question is not, God, what have I done wrong? Because you're implying that if you do it right, you're going to get consolation. Right? It's not about that. It's about God. What are you doing now? Not about what am I doing wrong? God, what are you doing? Where are you taking me now? We want to run away from the darkness. We want to run away from the dark nights of the soul when, when we are shaking. We want to run from it. We don't want to face it. Teresa of Avila talked about It's not time. When you're in the dark night of the soul, it's not time to pull weeds. Isn't that interesting? (laughs) When you're struggling with faith, it's not time to start pulling weeds. You know what she said? It's time to go into the weeds with the the gardener. You see what I mean? Because there's a reason why God shakes you in your faith. It's not always an attack from the devil. Amen? <laughs> Many times it's God shaking you like a Shemitah and a super Shemitah to wake you up. Come back, right? And so when we have those nights, when we have those struggles, we ask God, where are you leading me? I want to go see the weeds. Right? I want to go see the weeds. Show me the weeds. Go in with the gardener. Let him show you the weeds. Let him show you the roots. Let him show you the structures. Let him show you these things. These things are critical for your life. Critical. Inescapable. Critical. If you don't deal with them, they will haunt you forever. So God gives us dark nights. Just like this, you know, we have daytime, we have nighttime too. It's not our job to be spiritual, right? Uh, What is it? Uh, Addicts, right? (laughs) Only want the high from praising God, right? Right, even when we're praising, doing the praise songs, right? We're not trying to generate a high, Oh, yeah, yeah, I can feel it now. I can squeeze out a little experience, you know? (laughs) Right? When we're praising God, that's not what we're doing. Wherever you are, wherever your soul is, that's the time to see the weeds. Maybe you feel like worship. You feel like just, oh, yeah, you feel the Spirit. Maybe you don't. Feel how you feel without the Spirit. Experience the non-experience, right? (laughs) Then you'll have an experience. But don't generate it yourself. You can't. Surrender to Him. Right? Too many people in their relationship with Christ, with Father, with Jesus, they seek the pleasures of that relationship. The pleasures. The benefits of that relationship. And I can see that. I can see how the, when the, our different type of demons, archangels that surround mother. They don't seek a relationship with Christ, obviously. 
They seek the pleasures. They seek the benefits, the houses, the cars, the luxury, the mansions, the palaces, the shopping, the restaurants, all the benefits. You see? Not the relationship. And this is, this is like if, if you were married, right, to somebody. And if I just sought the pleasure of my relationship with my wife, I didn't seek yana. I didn't want yana. I just wanted the pleasure of that relationship. You know, you Ooh, me, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> power, power. That's called the Shaolin monk spin. And, uh, right? So it's not, it's not, I'm not trying, I'm not, it's, it's like want, having a relationship and just wanting the accoutrements of that relationship, the benefits, but not wanting that person. That's so. Right? Second Corinthians twelve nine talks about for my strength is made perfect in my weakness. God tells us that in the moments of weakness, really, when we're in the dark nights of the soul and we're struggling, our faith is struggling, our belief is struggling. That point of weakness can be our strength. It's a place where God can take us deeper. Deeper into Him. It can open up. Look at that. Open up. God purposely, purposefully opens up weakness. Purposefully. Purposefully opens up weakness. Right? To show, to reveal a new dependence on God. A new way we can depend on God. See, those dark nights of the soul, if we don't run for them, what does the scripture say? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will no evil. Even though you're in the valley, even though you're in the dark night, don't fear. Don't fear. God is purposely opening up weakness. It's a time of revelation. If you stay with him, if you stay with the gardener in that time, it's a time of revelation. Amen? It's a time of revelation. New insight, new depth. So let's read Chun Sun Yang, 160 here. With absolute faith, you will find one position. You will find the absolute position, the place where God resides. From there, everything will start to be resolved. Amen. Amen. Let's all rise. My wife's not speaking today. She was busy with the summer camp, but let's all rise and let's pray today. I want to ask everybody who wants to come down and switch their mind from belief to faith, make that declaration right here. Come on up right here. You want to switch your old man thinking of belief to faith. Let God touch it. Let God touch it. Come on down. We want to pray with you and for you at this altar. The temple of God is right here. The church is right here in amongst His people. Heavenly Father, we thank You this day. Father, we want to explore and go deep. Father, we want to get rid of misconceptions, weeds, not so that we can pull them, you can show us how they look like. Father, you can show us the roots, the root systems, the stem systems, the leaf systems, so we can understand and have knowledge of your purposeful will. We could have a greater knowledge of you, Father. And Father, today we pray that you would touch us so that we would change from believing and be divinely imparted with faith. Father, let us have faith that can move mountains. Father, let us us have faith that is solid like a house built on a rock. Father, let us have faith that can push through adversity, infirmity, and weakness. And in that time, darkness of the soul, Father, we know you are with us. You walk with us. You lead us as a shepherd as our Father. You hold our hand, guide us through it. 
You bring us into a new gift. A new gift of faith. Father, as we reclaim this faith, as we stop just trying to believe and think that's what we do by mustering it up in ourselves, Father, let us surrender our belief to you. Let us ask for the encounter with you, the divine touch of the Spirit, so that, Father, that belief, that 5% can be transformed by the 95%. Father, we know you are moving this world church. Everybody now from the worldwide church, more and more are waking up at this critical hour. And Father, it is so important that we understand properly, properly how to come and come close to you. Father, we pray that every single one of the brothers and sisters here would have a new infilling, indwelling revelation, time of revelation into the knowledge of your purposeful will. That you would persuade us in your goodness and grace. And that we would be gifted with absolute faith, absolute love, and absolute obedience. We thank you so much. And we give you all the praise, glory, and honor as we report these things in our own names. And we pray in your holy name. Amen. Adieu. Let's give God some praise, everybody. Hold, hug your neighbor. And say, believe to faith, baby. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>